Welcome to tonight's Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures. Just to recap for both you and the people that are remote, uh, last week we started with an introduction from me about uh, the overview of new ventures. We talked about a couple things to think about, including uh, creating value and capturing value. We talked about the three whys that you should think about as you look at a venture for yourself or to invest uh, why this? Why is this something important uh, that's worth your time or your money? The second one is why now? Why is this the right time to do whatever is being proposed? Uh, it could be a variety of reasons. Sometimes, especially for technology companies, you get a little bit ahead of the curve. So that's a good question there. The third is why this team? Why do I think the team that I'm looking at or the people I'm surrounding myself with, why do I think we can do it? And then the fourth why, if the other three are all positive, is why won't this work? What are the things that are going to be the impediments? And then I gave four examples of um, lessons I learned around the kind of components you need for a successful new venture. And that included an idea, execution, timing, and people. And if you get all of those to, to connect correctly, you're likely to increase your probability of success. That was the first part of the first evening. The second part was Bob Jones, who came and talked about finding your customer. And if you can't find a customer who values what you're doing, then you don't really have a venture at all. The second night, we had Mindy Garber come in and talk about uh, negotiation, and we ran through some negotiation uh, drills. Uh, and she was followed by a panel on organization and people issues, you know, people issues being one of the major reasons that ventures fail to, to meet their potential or fail in many cases. And then the following night, we had uh, Ken Zolot come in with the founder's journey, where you got to interview uh, two founding teams that are in the process of launching their ventures. And then I finished up that evening with a, a, a quite uh, fast and, and information-packed legal issue thing that probably blew by many people, but you have the deck, so you'll have a reference point. So that brings us to tonight, and we're going to do two things tonight. Bob Jones is back for the first part of the evening. If you have all of the things right, but you can't present your venture, uh, you're going to have a problem. And so Bob's going to help us talk about that. And then it will follow after that with Rich Kibble talking about business models, which is the how do we capture value component. All right. Okay, this part of the yeah, program is uh, business models. You know, we talked about creating value and then can you capture some of that value so you can do it again? That's often called the business model or the venture model if you're in a nonprofit situation. And tonight we have Rich Kivel, who has done this presentation uh, a number of times. Thank you, thank you Rich. Rich um, has been, I probably miss everything, but he's been a network, uh, computer network entrepreneur. Uh, he's been in uh, biotech, bioinformatics. Uh, he was a long-term judge at the 100K competition, and most recently over a venture capitalist working, I think, mostly out of Europe. But uh, I'll let him correct any of those uh, or amplify, as the case may be. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rich Kibble. Thank you, Joe. Great, Joe. Thank you. And it's it's always fun to be back. Joe and I have been doing this class, uh, I don't even know, 15 years or more, something like this. And it's, it's always amazing because I, I get the opportunity to talk about business models. And uh, what I love about that versus, let's say, a finance class is that the business model class changes every single year. Uh, you see new models coming out, new ways of operating, new ways of driving value, new kinds of businesses. Uh, so tonight, we're going to talk about business models, and we're going to try to cover a number of different type of industry types. Uh, so, you know, jump in anytime. If you have questions, if I'm going too fast, let me know. And uh, we'll, we'll also use some case studies uh, of companies that you're certainly familiar with. Uh, so I wanted to start off uh, by reading something that uh, I thought was fascinating. I was, I was 
in preparation for this class, uh, I was looking at some old notes and I came upon something in the MIT Technology Review from 2016. And uh, the one thing that doesn't change is the wisdom of Clayton Christensen, which I know is an important part of this class and, and a lot of the teaching. And you know, one of the things he said in this article uh, is that the hard truth about business model innovation is that many attempts at business model innovations fail. To change that, executives need to understand how business models develop through predictable stages over time, and then apply that understanding to key decisions around the business model of the moment. The hard truth about business model innovation is that it is not attributed directly to the innovator. What drives success in a company is an innovative culture, not an innovative person. And that's so true. I think Steve Jobs is an example. He gets a lot of credit for innovation, but he built an innovative culture. And that is one of the reasons Apple succeeded so much under his leadership. So think about that for a moment. As you as scientists or researchers or MBA students or people in the med tech field, think about building a company. Think about how you're building your culture and how that innovation is gonna play an important part of it. So we'll talk about a couple of things here today. I, I thought we'd start off with just a simple definition. So. When you think about a business model, it encompasses a lot of things, right? Depending on what industry you're from. We heard some of the students earlier talking about med technologies. I see up here on the wall, we've got FinTech energy, we've got AI learning, we've got enterprise software, mobile apps. These are all different types of technologies that can all be sold differently into different industries. Uh, but a definition of a business model really has to have three big components. One is a framework for operations. So when you think about defining your business model, the business model has to outline the structure and strategy that a company will need to create in order to deliver value. If you can't figure that out, you're not going to deliver value. Nobody will buy the product, which will make it very, very hard in order for the business to succeed and compete. And you know, as an investor, one of the things we ask our portfolio companies on a regular basis, but also the companies and entrepreneurs that we meet with is define for us your business model, explain it to us in simple terms, and also give us an idea of how the rest of the competition is defining their business model. What's your differentiation? Is it price, is it speed? There's many different components of it. But ultimately when you select one, it essentially becomes the framework of your operations in your business. It also drives your revenue generation plan. It defines how the company will ultimately earn revenue you know, whether that be through a direct sales team or subscription, advertising, freemium, all of us are susceptible to these and, and are exposed to these type of business models every day. Uh, we download a new app to our phone. It sounds fantastic. And immediately you notice that, you know, there's a free version. And of course, if you want a higher quality experience, you want to have more time on the app, you want to have more features, more data mining, you have to then pay a fee. Some apps don't charge any fee. We all use Google every single day. There's no fee to use Google. Google doesn't use the freemium model. What they use is the advertising model. So even though the interface may be the same, we may even be getting the same types of information from different type of technology. How that company ultimately creates a revenue plan is important. And of course, the value delivery method. It really informs how the company is going to deliver value to its customer, whether it be through a physical product or digital services or, or some other combination. Uh, everybody here is sitting with a laptop. That laptop, depending on how it was made and who it was made by, is delivering a value to you. So if you happen to be using a computer that's got an Intel processor, you're holding a computer, maybe it's a Dell, that computer is running software that was built by another company, not Dell. It was installed on that computer, most likely one of two ways. Either A, it was installed when you got the computer, right? it was pre-installed, it came defined within that computer, or it was installed because you downloaded. Maybe you downloaded Microsoft 365 or Adobe Acrobat. You then are paying a subscription to Microsoft or Adobe but you're using that Dell interface or that Apple interface, that experience is coming through that screen to you, but each of those companies has a different model. Dell selling hardware. 
Adobe is selling software. Microsoft 365, same thing. How they get onto your machine is also a different experience. You buy a computer that's running Microsoft. Almost all of us, we buy a computer, we go to Costco or Best Buy or someplace, we buy a computer and it comes with Microsoft built into it if it happens to be a PC. And that experience is what we call OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. It's a whole different experience because your computer came with that software built into it and also came with that Intel chip. You didn't have to go and download a chip to run your software, to run your computer. But you may not use Adobe. So you may not even consider that as an application of your choice. But if you do, you're then gonna to go to the cloud and download it. So think about, even though you're having the same experience on the same machine using software, each of those companies had a different definition of how they were gonna sell. Even the hardware companies had a different definition of how they were gonna sell. Dell sells everything pretty much online. They have some distribution, but I don't know about you, I've never actually walked by a Dell store but I do walk by an Apple store every day. So Apple chose a different way to sell their hardware. So you can buy it online, you can buy it in their store. Dell decided to create a different model, which was customization very, very early on, where you can actually define what you want in your computer. Some of you might be doing gaming or you might be doing website development. You wanted a larger screen. You wanted a faster processor. Perhaps you wanted more memory. So you were able to define those things online with that computer and it showed up to your house. Somebody else like myself perhaps says, I travel all the time. I need something super lightweight, very, very easy, not cumbersome, and it needs to be fast. It needs to run lots of programs at the same time. That customization is another piece of the Dell business. So think about that as you use products. Um, so a well-defined business model, really simple, is it, it's, it's got a clear strategic direction, right? It's well-defined, it offers a clear roadmap, and it helps align the company to its goals and objectives. And also, it maintains consistency in the marketplace for communication. Think about luxury items for a moment. If you have a luxury item, let's imagine you have a Canada Goose jacket. That Canada Goose jacket is sold in a very particular way. It's an experience. Anybody here been to the Canada Goose store in the Prudential Center? It's a great experience. You go, you've been there. When there's not a line to get in, when there's not a line to get in, you can actually scoot right in. What's amazing is they make a jacket that looks pretty much like every other jacket, but it's differentiated in a lot of ways. Number one, it has that nice patch on the side so everybody can tell which jacket it is. So they've separated themselves from your regular ski jacket. You walk into their store, it's a different experience. They actually have a walk-in freezer inside their store. So you can put on a jacket and go into a sub-zero temperature inside the store to experience the warmth of that jacket. Now, you can get away with doing those things and paying the rent at the Prudential Center when you charge $1,400 for a jacket. It's a different experience than if you went to Walmart and bought a jacket. That jacket will be $39.99. Probably there's not a freezer to try it on and it's probably not gonna last as long, but there's consistency in the business model. Canada Goose is giving you an experience, a luxury experience, whereas other shops are just simply giving you a jacket. So think about that every time you buy something. The clear strategic direction of your product must be consistent throughout the entire supply chain. It must be consistent in your advertising and how you think about your business. Number two is really efficient resource allocation. When you think about allocating resources uh, in a company, it's really important to think about your business model. If you're going to be selling a product that is going to be online, it's an entirely different world. You have to buy ad space. You have to think about how many clicks. You have to do all of these very special things in order to drive revenue to your website or to your download or whatever it might be or to your YouTube channel. That is much different than buying shelf space. So if you're building, let's say, a food product, you've decided to enter the market of healthy foods, nutritional products, 
and you want to go into Whole Foods as a distribution channel, it's an entirely different model. You have to think about packaging differently. You have to think about expiration periods, shipping, receiving, distribution. You have to think about pricing in an entirely different way. You have to price it perfectly. It can't be too high. It can't be too low. Also, you're essentially buying shelf space. When you go to a supermarket, they just don't randomly select one of the five different shelves to put products on. The companies that are paying the highest price to the supermarket are at eye level. That's how it works. It's why you see Coca-Cola, Red Bull, Pepsi. It's why you see Post Cereal. If you are not able to pay that price, you're gonna be either on the lowest shelf or maybe the highest shelf, which is hard to reach. So even thinking about the finer details of your business model, how am I gonna sell my nutritional granola bars that I think are game changing, they're high in protein, they're super healthy, how am I going to get that in a consumer's hands? If I decide to go the shelf space, I need to have a budget. I need to be able to think through my resource allocation in order to effectively target my customers. And even I, I, I picked Whole Foods out, but if your brand is actually not at a right level, Whole Foods might not be the right place for you. Maybe you're better off going to general stores. You're going to the large big box stores. Or maybe you're going to the specialty stores, you're going to the GNC, you're going to the nutrition centers. So you have to think about your business model has to be consistent with your product, consistent to your message, consistent with the client you're trying to get, and then you need to allocate resources accordingly. And then of course, the value proposition has to be completely clear. There needs to be a, a way to artic articulate the value proposition of your product in comparison to the competitors. Once you lose that, you ultimately have a challenge to differentiate yourself. You start to look like everyone else, and then it will just become a race to the bottom. People will compete with you against price if you're not differentiated in other ways. Questions, comments? All right, let's keep going, and we'll jump into some examples. So, you know, factors to consider. Um, I was sitting with a team just last week, um, our company, uh, as Joe had mentioned, my background was really on the management side and the sales and marketing side uh, of companies. I started my career in technology back in the years when Joe and I met. And then I sort of took a tiny baby step um, from technology into life science biotechnology um, and was running a company that was an MIT spin out uh, that won the MIT entrepreneurship competition. Uh, back in the days when it was actually called the 50K Entrepreneurship Competition. And uh, this company had won the competition back in 99, and then I joined the company a number of years later. And it was a company in the field of bioinformatics, which is a fancy way of saying software for scientists. And uh, that was a venture-backed company, UK investors, entirely different demands than what I had expected or experienced, I should say, before. And the ability to communicate to our investors why they should put capital in became very, very important. Once we were able to persuade them, we had to think about our business model. So when we think about the business model of that company, which is a great case study unto itself, is we had to do these things. We had to do a detailed market analysis. We needed to think about how are the competitive uh, landscape, how is the competitive landscape evolving? Who are we competing against? What is the target audience? And in this case, it was interesting. And we're going to talk more about individual types of business models in a few minutes. But we actually wound up choosing multiple business models over the life of that company before it was ultimately acquired. Uh, we started off as a direct to scientist, direct to lab, direct to company type of approach. That meant that we had to hire a small sales team. We needed to have material. We needed to have marketing aids. We needed to go to conferences and trade shows where we knew that our audience, our potential users, were going to be acquiring that kind of software. So that was a lot of fun because we were dealing with people like you know, long before the Broad Institute, um, I should say the Whitehead and the Broad Institute, we were dealing uh, with uh, Eric Lander and a number of other people that were just doing very simple research here at MIT around genomics and genetics. And we were able to present to them that instead of each instrument in their lab having its own PC and its 
own software, most of the time using Excel, we were able to create a single software, single computer that talked to everything in the laboratory. So we started to build momentum within the academic marketplace. So groups here at MIT, at Harvard, at the Riken Institute for Genomic Research in Japan. And then ultimately we moved to a different business model. We realized that we needed to start selling internationally, but we did not have the resources to hire salespeople globally for this. So we went to a different model, which was distribution and partnerships. So in Asia, we hired a phenomenal group called CTC that had salespeople throughout Asia. This was another tool in their kit. They were already going out and visiting with the clients that we wanted to get into, but there was no way we were gonna build uh, an international sales force as a small startup sitting here in Cambridge. So that became the next channel for us. So we maintained direct sales in academic institutions where we really had great relationships in the US. We then did distribution partnership sales throughout Asia. We then did one of those in Europe, which was quite successful. And then one thing we learned as our technology evolved is that one of the problems in our industry was that the primary instruments that these scientists were using, one of them is a pin tool robot that is a microfluidics robot. The other one is a scanner, a visualization scanner that allows you to look at all of the little spots of DNA. And everybody complained about the software on the scanners. They love the quality of the scanner, the imaging of the scanner, but they complained about the scanner software. It was a nightmare to use. We then partnered with the scanner company. They threw out, and I'm obviously shrinking the story down to a few moments, but it took about a year of negotiating. They took out their software, they installed our software. It became essentially an OEM channel for us. So every single time a company in Issaquah, Washington called Applied Precision, every time they sold a scanner to a company, didn't matter where in the world, it was running our software. Very similar to the analogy we used earlier about computers with Intel inside. So a business model needs to evolve as the company evolves. Had we just gone all out in one particular direction, we would have missed opportunities in our marketplace very, very quickly. So um, some of the challenges, I'll kind of blast through some of these and we'll get into some fun examples. Um, you know, pitfalls, obviously, overcomplicating the model. This is a real challenge, especially with early stage companies. You've got people that have all different types of experience. Some of them want to go direct to consumer and have downloadables. Another one wants to be able to sell through trade shows or sell through huge partners. There's lots of ways to do it, but pick your battle. As I shared with you the story about the company Moleculaware, the, the one that spun out of MIT, that, you know, we chose one model. That was it. Now, we knew in our hearts, this was not going to be the be-all, end-all model. But we knew that as a small company, we needed to demonstrate success. We needed to put some numbers in, on the board, put some wins up there. We needed to get an installed base that was big enough that we could actually talk about it to larger clients. We also discounted the software pretty heavily for the first users because they not only helped us price the software for the larger market, but they helped us better design it and they also became references. And that allowed us to move to the second and the third level of business models. So it's really important, don't overcomplicate it, pick one battle, go after it. If it doesn't work, move to the next, but don't go out in the beginning of your companies and try to do three different models all at once. Very challenging. Of course, market dynamics, lots of great stories of companies that totally missed the market dynamics and how the market was shifting. Um, it also shows a lack of flexibility, which is another real big pitfall. Uh, companies became very, very convinced that this is how we sell and we've always sold this way and we're not gonna change. Uh, all of us could probably think very quickly about companies that have just disappeared over the past number of years. Companies that were all the rage, perhaps they were unicorn companies and now they're gone. Can anybody give me a couple of names you could think of, of companies perhaps you used that you enjoyed either online or even in person? Nokia. You do. It is a little brick. People do love it, right? Any companies that you've seen just evaporate? 
Blockbuster, absolutely. Well, gone. What do you think they did wrong? Because I don't know that that story. So failure to change the model sank that ship. Anybody remember Bed Bath and Beyond? Not much of it. Completely failed. Sears. Who here can remember how big Sears was in the seventies, eighties, nineties? It was a Sears everywhere. They were the anchor tenant in every mall in the United States. And you bought everything from, from your jeans to your lawnmower, to your washer dryer, to your refrigerator, to your tools. You got everything there. You got your car repaired there. You got new tires there. Sears evaporate. Poof. I don't know how many are left, but as sure as heck is not many. Uh, a great example is Blockbuster. Many of you are too young to remember Blockbuster. Um, but for those of you that can remember, if you can imagine this actually happened, uh, you would want to have date night, you know, Friday night. And you would go with your significant other into a retail store that looked like a CVS. And there were lines and lines and lines of shelves. And you'd go and you'd look at the signs. You'd say, oh, we're going to get a romantic comedy tonight. You would go over to the rom-com section and you would look at all of the plastic boxes that had VCR tapes in them. And you would just go down and you'd say, oh, shit, they're out of that one. We really, really wanted to see, you know, when Harry met Sally, but they don't have that which is kind of a bizarre concept for all of us, right? Is that we couldn't find it in stock. And then you would find the one or two, you'd go up to the counter and you would rent them one day, two day, three days. And then it always became a tremendous competition, usually on Sundays, to try to get it back to the store fast enough, early enough before that little slot turned the time to the next day. And then you were charged a late fee. Who can remember this? I see a few people are laughing. So think about that. I mean, at the time it was revolutionary. You've got this incredible idea that instead of going to a movie theater, you're gonna go just into a store, you're gonna have a choice of a thousand different movies to pick from. You're gonna go home, you're gonna watch it. You better rewind the tape or you actually, I think get charged for that. And then you gotta return it to the next day. That way your neighbors and friends can use it. And it made so much sense. And Blockbuster became a multi-billion dollar company. Then this little company, popped up. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. This little dinky ass company showed up and said, hey, we got an idea. We're not opening stores. And now technology has improved so much that we have gone from VCR tapes to DVDs. DVDs can fit into an envelope. Why don't we just get warehouses around the country, fill the warehouses with DVDs. And then when someone orders the DVD, they order when Harry met Sally, or the Wizard of Oz, or James Bond, we're just gonna mail it to their house. And because we had distribution centers around the US, you're talking like one day, two day delivery at most, which back then was mind boggling, right? We're all spoiled now, we expect one day delivery and we complain if it's two. That's how they started. So Netflix had this idea, we don't need stores. Think about the hundreds of millions you save by not having retail locations, employees, insurance, signage, everything A to Z, just to have that retail location. That was a differentiating factor in their what? In their business model. That separated them so much from Blockbuster, but Blockbuster still didn't care. They had the market share, they had the name brand, and they sat back and hoped that people wouldn't be so impressed by this new delivery mechanism of getting a DVD in the mail, they could come to Blockbuster, which was now providing DVDs in nice plastic cases. But they had literally a billion dollars of leases around the world for retail space that they were paying for. But people weren't coming anymore. Why would they? I would just go on my computer. I would pull up the, block, the uh, Netflix site. I would choose my four movies. And there is no return problems. If I keep it a day, I keep it a week, it doesn't really matter. Depending on what subscription I bought, $5.99 a month, $7.99 a month, it 
allowed me to buy two or three or rent two or three or four different movies. So it was a phenomenal business model change. And we'll talk a little bit more about these guys in a minute because I think we all know now they do a little bit more than DVDs. Uh, last year, actually, a little, little factoid. This will definitely come up in some trivia thing someday. Last year, I think it was uh, Q3 or Q4, was the last DVD Netflix will ever mail. They announced it in April of last year and last Q3 or Q4, they said, we are mailing our very last DVD to customers because the world has changed. We can now download a movie in seconds or just simply stream it. So uh, love that example. Thank you. Uh, so going, uh, where are we? Boom. When you look at a company like a Netflix, you look at companies like Uber, Airbnb, what they've achieved essentially is harmony. They've achieved a way of satisfying their customers, their distributors, their partners, their investors, and creating tremendous value. They have value through their delivery mechanism. They essentially are creating value through the experience that you have. And they're capturing value, which drives revenue and drives market capitalizations of the company. So going back to some real world examples, take a look at these. Everybody knows all of these companies up here. Thankfully, I think they're all still in business. But think about this for a second. Amazon. What did Amazon start off as? Exactly. That's it. And it was ingenious, right? Because Jeff Bezos, he knew in his mind this was going to be way more than a bookstore. But investors, speaking from experience, we don't want to hear 10 different business models. We do not want to hear that you're going to be the be all end all of everyone. We certainly don't want to hear that your new company is going to compete with Walmart, the biggest company in the world at the time. So he said, books, books are awesome. Why would you choose books? What would be the reason to choose books versus anything else? What are some reasons that books just make sense? Um, all right, if you, which one? They always fit, right? You don't ship them back. It didn't come in the wrong size, right? What else? You've got, so essentially you've got unlimited amounts of titles. So at any moment you can wind up getting, you don't ever get bored, right? People love to buy books. Why else? When you ship them. So you don't have this problem because the box has a little dent in it. It didn't break the microchip or the, the light bulbs. It didn't damage the food product or destroy the flowers. And books don't expire. So they don't go out of style. So he had an ingenious model, which was simply, I'm going to disintermediate this entire crazy world of publishing. And companies, which many of which are now gone, at the time, were just shocked by this. You still have Barnes & Noble. Who are a few of the other big ones that people remember? Borders is everywhere, right? Waterstones? Which one? Yep. So you have these, these groups, like think about it. you walk in, I mean, there's a wonderful Barnes and Noble actually right near my house on the South shore next to the Apple store. It is, it could be a supermarket. It's so big. And what they've done is they've been smart. They've changed their business. They're doing online. They have a cafe. They, they've survived. The other ones got crushed because why am I going to go there and drive in the rain or in a beautiful cold night? and search shelf after shelf. I can go on in one second order. So the Amazon story is, is probably one of the greatest examples in the world of an entrepreneur who had a vision, which was to leverage this thing called the internet and sell something that was so easy to sell and no one's gonna return, it's easy to ship. And in buying in bulk, he was getting better prices than the Barnes and Noble and the Waterstones that were out there. And now we know that there's a great story behind what that ultimately has become. You know, Airbnb is a great example. They currently have more bedrooms than all of the top 10 hotel chains combined. And they don't own real estate. Think about that. Uber. They have more vehicles than Hertz, Avis, National, 
and they own very, very few cars. And then they moved into other businesses, right? They said, well, geez, if we can deliver people anywhere, why can't we deliver food? So you've got Uber Eats. Tremendous ideas that have revolutionized the business model world and changed our lives. And every one of these companies, without exception, the business model they started off with, they may still be using, but they've modified and continue to enhance and improve their business model, which is a sign of a great company, great leadership. These companies that don't change die. They get crushed. These guys continue to change on a regular basis. So let's talk about some examples. Um, we shared a few today, right? Um, do you have a question? Yeah, exactly. So it, we'd have to run five hours of class for three days to go into every business model and the structure. So we're gonna keep this really high level. Um, perhaps go into a little more detail about these. So sort of subscription, freemium, marketplace, and advertising, all right? Um, and we'll touch very lightly upon some other models as well, which is you know direct sales, OEMs, resellers. And I think I gave you a few examples of those already, right? So direct sales, hire a sales team, the sales team goes out, does stuff. And in order to do that, it's incredibly expensive. You have to have sales management, you have to have all sorts of methodologies in order to train your salespeople. You have to have a very complex CRM solution in order to manage all the leads, the customer relationship management, et cetera. You have to have competitive pricing. You have to be able to manage the salespeople, assign them territory, give them commissions, et cetera. It works. There's lots of companies that do this every day and they're very successful. OEM we talked about, right? Sort of a way of, you know, OEM again is original equipment manufacturer. So it's a way of bundling whatever your product is into someone else's product. And then of course, reseller and partners. Reseller and partners is a phenomenal way to sell products, especially if it's outside of your market, if it's an area that is even outside of, you know, let's say your area of expertise. There's companies in the medical device field that sell directly to consumers. If you take a look at groups like Johnson & Johnson, they have an entire consumer products division, massive, one of the biggest in the world. And they'll sell everything from Q-tips to cotton balls. They have the pharmaceutical side of the business. They have the diagnostic and the imaging side of the business. And then they have the hospital side of the business, which is an entirely different mechanism. They're still selling cotton balls and Q-tips, but they're selling them not on their own and not to the consumer, but they're selling them through a distribution channel that serves that market really well. But the ones that you guys are probably most familiar with and for a lot of your businesses, it's gonna be around some of the things we see here at the top. So subscription model, companies like Netflix, Spotify, they essentially drive revenue by getting more subscribers. One way to get subscribers is to use a freemium model. You sign up to Dropbox, it's free. It requires nothing but an email address and a password and boom, you have storage, You've got a phenomenal mechanism in order to share photos, share documents. It's highly secure, very encrypted in the cloud. And you can access your documents from anywhere, whether it be on your phone, your PC, you can email it to people. They can click on the link, boom, it pops right up. They don't even need a subscription to Dropbox in order to open the document. But once you start to use that as a business, you certainly then want to upgrade. You want to do a model that is a subscription model. So there's different ways of thinking about this. And of course, you know, marketplace models are incredible. This is probably one of the ways that has changed, I would say, the way all of us as consumers operate. We talked about it a few moments ago with some of the examples like Airbnb. Think about eBay. What's the other one? Etsy? Anybody here use Etsy? Phenomenal. Craigslist. Still, the worst user interface on the face of the earth, it's a billion dollar. Can you imagine that? Right. Worst user interface, but people trust it, they like it, they believe in it. So what you have there is a marketplace model where essentially you know, you're connecting a buyer and you're a seller, you're just taking a commission in the middle. I mean, how elegant is that? I mean, it's a beautiful model. eBay's perfected that. And of course, a lot of people became billionaires because of 
not just creating and working at eBay, but just creating tools that are now on eBay. PayPal. PayPal became a multi-billion dollar company. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, the list goes on. What they call the PayPal mafia on the West Coast. Because they created a seamless system to actually transact on eBay. It's absolutely phenomenal. So you don't need to create an eBay. You need to think about how can I build a business in order to leverage the platform that they've already built. I don't want to rebuild eBay. I don't want to rebuild Amazon. But there's people making millions of dollars a year in the Amazon marketplace. And it's gotten so phenomenal now that you can have a product. I don't care what it is. It could be a widget. And that widget can be sold through Amazon. They will take delivery of your products from wherever you got them. You might have gotten them from Alibaba. They will take delivery of the products. They will package them, ship them directly to the person that bought it off of their website. It's unbelievable. You're able to do this. In the old days, you literally have to take inventory. You'd have a garage full of whatever it is that you were selling. And you'd have to figure out how do we package these things and get them out to the consumers and do we have the right address and everything else. It's absolutely incredible. So the marketplace model has changed the world. And certainly advertising is never going anywhere. Um, whether it be uh, traditional advertising or it be really creative ways of advertising, now using AI, we're seeing advertising really taking an entirely giant leap. All of us have felt that little weird thing where we search for something one day and the next day it shows up in the Amazon ad. Uh, it's the same product, the same, you're, you're looking for a vacation and all of a sudden it starts showing up regularly. So the use of AI and other really machine learning tools are allowing advertisers to be very pinpoint, very, very active and very, I guess you could say, uh, uh, less noisy. All of us remember when you used to just get unlimited amounts of junk mail to your house. And, and it could have been for things that you would never in a million years buy. Now you're able to reduce the noise, reduce all of the other things and have very specific types of advertising. So I'm gonna pause there to see if there's questions, comments, something I may have gone over too fast. So again, that was, um, so OEM is Original Equipment Manufacturer. So like your computer there, it's powered by perhaps an Intel chip. That chip has an OEM relationship with the manufacturer of the computer. Microsoft has the same type of relationship with lots of computer companies. So you get Microsoft free version, right? So think about that. Microsoft is using the OEM model to get onto your Dell computer or your Lenovo computer and then they're using the freemium model to get you to use the product. So you get the free version of Microsoft, limitations, et cetera, et cetera. And then boom, you sign up for the subscription. You have full Microsoft 365. You got cloud storage for free, et cetera. So one company sells one series of products through an OEM channel, which gives them access to consumers. And then you become a subscriber. Drives revenue like crazy. Other questions, comments? Yep, please. So a lot of businesses are just saying, if I want to switch the platform, oh, wait, I'll have to have a lot of people. They only need to switch the model. So I need to research behind that. I'm very curious. So could you give me a No, it, it, it's a great question. And I think some use subscription and advertising, right? So some just use subscription. If you are in a platform that is already holding, owning, or developing very, very high quality content, people will pay a subscription, right? No one's gonna pay a subscription to use Google search. Right? There's no content, but I'll pay a subscription for Bloomberg. I'll pay a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. I'll pay a subscription to Netflix because they have the content. And the content's the value. Now, think about Netflix, how they've completely changed not only the movie industry, but they've changed the entire industry of content ownership. They will put movies on their platform and pay whoever, Warner Brothers, but they also develop their own content now. 
So that makes the subscription model become even more valuable. Now, they could reduce the subscription price, right? And maybe start doing advertising, but that would probably drive people crazy, right? We don't wanna watch a movie and see ads popping up every 18 minutes, right? We already, we already suffer on television with that. So that's really one of the reasons. I'm sure there's many other. Did they answer your question? Yep. You know, one of the things they, oh, one of the things they said was, you know, you know, you can only validate if you have users, if they're willing to pay. Right. Or one of the things is like, you know, the most valuable form of like, if you're to know that you're building something great or not, is if they're willing to pay. But how does that kind of build in here to the different, like, you know, business models, you know, for example, if you're doing something that's content based, how do you validate you're building something useful to your users, you know, when you're looking at like a freemium or maybe even like an advertising kind of model. I'm not, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but I think it's how do you have a freemium model no, that moves to subscription? Basically, how do you validate, <laughs> how do you validate any of these um, business models when you're just starting out um, and you're building out your startup? You know, it, it's a great point. I think a lot of it is trial and error, right? And we see all the time subscription models changing. I mean, in the venture capital industry, we subscribe to a number of publications. It could be PitchBook, it could be Deal Room, and quite frankly, some of them require a subscription, some of them don't. But even in those type of businesses, we're seeing subscription prices go up and down. And it's because people are valuing that subscription less. So they might have been charging $29 a month for a subscription to Deal Room, and now it's basically $4.99 a month but then you buy their premium version. So you have to have that fluidity, that flexibility that you are willing to modify your pricing up or down in order to capture the market share that you want. So think about another big piece of it is what you're measuring. Right? And this is, it's really worth noting is, you know, not every company is the same. Right? How do you measure success? If your company measures success as top line revenue, it's hard to reduce that subscription price. If, if you really are just looking for top line revenue, you'd rather have less customers Ooh. paying $59 a month than a gazillion customers paying $4.99, right? So think about in your business, what is it that drives your company to succeed? And the answer is not the same in every company. Even companies in the same exact industry have different things that they wanna measure. If profitability is your standard of measurement, you have to think about pricing, distribution, partnership in an entirely different way. But if you're an internet-driven company, maybe it's users. You don't really care if you get paid for the first five years. That's why you have people like us that will invest in that company. And we're not talking at the board meetings about top line revenue, margins, EBITDA. We're talking about how many users, how many how many people are using the product? How many downloads did you get? What is the retention curve? Right. So you had 500,000 downloads last year. Great. How many of those 500,000 are actually still using the product? So think about what's driving your business. And then ultimately, you have to modify your pricing uh, in order to do that. Um, you said something also I thought was, was good. You use the acronym. Does everybody know what that means? MVP? It's not most valuable player. Minimum viable product. And that's really important, especially for the engineers in the room um, who don't want to release something until it's absolutely perfect. Create a minimum viable product. Get it out into the market. Test it in the market. Let people play with it, beat on it, try it, download it. Get it into the marketplace. And then you refine it, you create the next version. Microsoft has been absolutely stellar at this. They put out a product. Yeah, it's got a bunch of bugs. It's okay. They're going to put out a patch in three weeks. But they put that product out. It's in your hands and you're using it. And then the patch comes and the next patch comes. So minimum viable product is a great way of thinking about how you go into your marketplace. And you can't do this in every industry. Right? Technology, you can do it. Healthcare, not so much. You can't put out a minimum viable product for therapeutics to treat cancer. 
you can't have a minimum viable, pro viable product that's going to diagnose disease. And it kind of works, but not all the time. So there's different industries that are going to have standards that are completely different, where you know an MVP basically is going to be something you share internally well before you get it to the marketplace. But in most cases, you bring it to the marketplace. Uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, like B2B subscription like model like PeachBook, like Dearum, yeah. uh, Merger Market, things like this. And then you mentioned also pricing. And uh, I'm very interested to know how much that those uh, do those like B2B subscription um, uh, solutions co like clients, like VC firms, how much do they care about pricing here? If that's something really matters for them? It, it certainly. It's interesting. Um, B2B, typically, the subscription pricing is not that big of a deal. Right? Consumer pricing is huge. B2C, business to consumer, it is it's a tremendous, tremendous hurdle to figure out how do I price this in a way that it's both competitive but also reflects the value that we are providing. Right? Um, in the business to business world, once you start to re, you know, reach a certain level of, of penetration within the, mar the marketplace, um, unless you start to do really stupid things or a competitor comes out of nowhere and changes your market, you're going to have long-term relationships with your client. You're going to continue to add value. PitchBook's a great example of that. They charge $20,000 a year for the subscription to PitchBook. Maybe it's $24,000 now. And venture funds pay that all day long. Hedge funds pay it all day long because I know that their data is so curated. I can literally search every detail I want. I want to know how many venture funds are in Berlin that are interested in fintech, but B2B fintech, not consumed fintech. I, I can narrow it down. Then I can even go to the next sub-level and I can say how many of them, of those funds are investing at series C to series A, how many are doing later stage and how many are doing basically private equity. And what are the challenges for B2B SaaS compared to B2C SaaS then? Yeah, I think there's endless challenges, right? Because SaaS is just, it's SaaS. It's SaaS is subscription, right? It's software as a subscription. So it's the same answer. Really, I mean, you know, think about us, you know, all of us, we're using, you know, Dropbox, you know, or maybe you're using a photo site to store all your photos on. It's a SaaS platform, right? It's in the cloud and SaaS is, you know, subscription. It's software as a service. So you've got a subscription model. It's software. It's running on your machine. It's a service. The, the beauty is, I mean, one of the reasons, for example, um, photo sharing websites have done so well over the years. Some of them have exploded, of course, when better ones come out. Google Photos, Google Pics, as an example. It's because they hold your content. So... Something else to think about when you're thinking about subscription models is can we develop a model where the switching cost is so high that people will be unlikely to change? Okay. The mobile phone industry used to have the power to retain you as a client forever. You may not remember this, but there was a point when in mobile phone industry, if I had an AT&T phone, even if I had it for 15 years, everybody in my life knows that number. If I moved to Sprint, I got a new phone number. So they were able to retain us as clients. The switching cost was so high. Now they can't do that anymore. So I can move to another carrier instantly. Six months later, boom, move to another carrier. I keep taking my phone with me. So think about if you can create ways that the switching cost is high, the one way to create it high is to have, you know, 25,000 family photos on their particular site. You're probably going to keep paying that subscription because the time it would take you to move them to a different application completely, eh, what are you going to save? Two bucks a month? You don't even think about it. Joe? Rich, just a quick question on our uh, comment on minimum viable products since it appeared people didn't know much about it. You can think of it as what is the minimum thing I need in order to test a hypothesis? So the one example is Zappos. The question was, would people buy shoes online? So they figured out what was the minimum thing we needed to do to test that out. And they learned something. They learned in the process that people would buy shoes online if they could return them for free. And that changed the model. So a whole other thing that 
to talk about, but uh, we just wanted to close that loop a little bit. That, that's a really great point because if they continue to wait and wait and wait until they had the absolute most perfect selection of shoes, all the sizes, shapes, models, they start off with a minimum level. Right? They say, listen, we're going to do these four brands. We're going to start to see if we can sell them and if people enjoy it. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, free returns has become something that we all assume exists. And, you know, when you have very often, you know, something that requires that you're going to pay to return it, you think twice about it. You make sure, you know, it better fit. And with shoes or clothes or a lot of things, we need to be able to return them quickly. So that becomes a differentiator. And it also becomes a differentiator, not only in the competitive landscape of companies like that company, but also against the big box stores, where in order to return it, I have to drive back to the store, park my car, walk through the mall, stand in line in a register, right? So it's it's that differentiating um, pieces that really makes sense, but you can't know if it's gonna work until you do what Joe said, which is get that minimum viable product out there, test it, test it, and test it. Any other questions before we keep jumping? Yeah, just a question. Uh, if you talk about green energy market, green yeah. energy technology, and especially not in the space, green energy technology in not in the space of B2C, uh, for example, B2B, what business models you know, or for example, there is some innovative approaches, how you sell, especially considering the green technology is something hard to cap capture in terms of value. And even if you capture it's long term because the money sometimes doesn't end up. It's more about, uh, I don't know, uh, green vision and et cetera. With some tax insensitive, it's getting way more beneficial. But the problem, you're never in direct contact with the people who actually will buy it. So you go usually through the engineering companies and et cetera. So you never deliver this tax insensitive and this money uh, to directly to the customer. You basically go through a bunch of engineering firms before it's reach direct customer. Yeah, the green energy piece is really interesting because it, it it actually is consumer as well as business driven, right? I mean, we all have the power to put solar panels on our roof we could wind up doing other types of things that will actually make our homes more efficient, our apartment buildings more efficient or whatever. But as you point out, sort of the B2B side of the energy sector or the, the green initiatives is fascinating because a lot of it was all driven by tax incentives. And, and what became a real problem in that industry or in, in, in that sector was that once the tax incentives went away, the purchasing of those things went away. Um, so what's happened now is you're starting to see incentives, uh, not from governments, but also you're, you're seeing incentives from the utility companies. So, for example, I just came back from Spain. And when you're in Spain, especially if you're out in the countryside, you just see windmills, literally miles and miles and miles and miles of windmills on all the hills. It's absolutely beautiful. You go up to Andalusia or you wind up going up towards Bilbao, the Basque region. And it's long highways. You're not driving by houses. And it's just gorgeous. Uh, you see these windmills in the distant distance. And th the thing is, a lot of them were built because of government incentives. But once those go away or they get lessened, which always happens, right? Just like buying electric vehicles had very high incentives at one point, and then it went down. That's another example. Um, what you have to do then is figure out how do we make money out of these things without the government incentives? Right? It's a lot easier to do it with government incentives. But without it, and what many of these groups have done that own sectors of windmills, as one example, is they tie it into the grid. So essentially, they are providing benefit to the grid itself, as opposed to just simply running the windmills as a way to power the local region. They actually are able to store and distribute that power nationally or further out. And then you have an entire another business that emerged, which is the maintenance uh, companies like GE uh, are, they bought four or five different organizations. The maintenance and repair of those windmills has become an entirely different business. So now you have numbers of organizations making money off of each windmill, as opposed to before, people put it up because the jobs were paid for, they put a little bit of electricity into the local grid, and there was huge tax incentives. So what that tells you is that if you're moving into an industry like that, right, the energy sector is one of them, you can't count on the tax incentives for long. So you have to think about how else are we going to make money from this one unit? And what they've been able to do is tie it into a much wider grid. But also you now have had, and this wasn't happening 10 years ago, 
you now have the emergence of all of these power machines, to, you know, power uh, stations to charge your cars. So now they're able to now power a lot of those stations using that same energy that's being stored. So you're seeing, you look at the business model 10 or 15 years ago, it was limited. It was basically the government is our customer and one local utility company. And now it is, the government is really not a customer. We service 10 utility companies. We also sell directly to large um, corporations. So if you have manufacturing facilities that are building products, you may buy directly from that as opposed to from the grid because it's less expensive. So it's just being aware of those different changes are really critical. That answer at least part of your question or? Yeah. Well, and, in terms of, and in terms of utility or selling energy in US, I I'm, I'm think it will be much stricter regulations compared to Europe. Like if you wanna sell energy, like is, is it electrical energy or thermal energy, for example, like, for example, if you take a look at Canada, in Canada, this is unregulated area. So you can actually go and build thermal stations and sell the thermal energy. Like, for example, Toronto, there is like a geothermal revolution, like 80% of the new buildings coming with geothermal energy. But in US, I think it's highly regulated. And this type of business, I don't know, will kick off or not. Well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the companies that we actually just were looking at recently is in the area of... Uh, well, essentially, it's a data storage play, right? So everything's now moved to the cloud. So what you have is the amount of servers that are running all of the cloud applications that are out there, whether it be Microsoft or it be Dropbox. I mean, the list just goes on. Everything's in the cloud. What people don't realize is the amount of energy that takes, right? I mean, you've got rooms 100 times the size that are filled with just racks and racks and racks of servers. And you have two major issues there. You have one issue, which is just, the amount of power and energy it takes to keep the lights on, just to keep those servers running is breathtaking. The second problem that you have is the heat that's being generated. So what companies are trying to figure out now is we can't keep pulling all of that energy from the grid. It's too expensive. And it also has a negative impact on the local grid. So many of these facilities are now doing two things. Number one, they're putting up their own power plants that very often are either wind or solar. And they're building these underground. So they're going so far underground, you have perpetual cooling. Because right now, most of the cost to actually maintain a data center is going to be not plugging the servers in. It is cooling the facility where your 10,000 servers are sitting. So it's, it's phenomenal how this has evolved. And there's a lot of fear and concern right now because AI is taking up so much more power, right? It's one of the reasons you've seen, everybody's heard of NVIDIA. Right, the NVIDIA chips is absolutely mind-boggling. This company now has become really the world's leader in chips for AI-driven computation. So that's a lot of heat and a lot of power that needs to be generated. So you have to come up with creative ways of doing this. So there's, I guess I would say, there's tons of business opportunities out there for people that want to be in that field. Any other questions, comments? We talked about Netflix. I think we beat this one to death. Any, you have a question? Uh, I recently used a few softwares that upon release, like uh, they're startups, upon release, they offer their service for free, let's say for two years, and then suddenly they say, hey, now we're a subscription service. What, what's your view on this? So good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's phenomenal because quite frankly, as long as there's a high level of transparency, it is a very good way of operating, right? What you don't want to do is sign up for free and then they suddenly hit you with a subscription 18 months later. But if there's a high level of transparency, it really makes sense. I mean, we use a product called Affinity. And Affinity is a product that a lot of venture capital funds and private equity funds use. And it's really specially designed for our industry where all of the sources of capital that we are dealing with, whether it be banks, family offices, institutional investors, we store it in Affinity. It's an incredible way. It's like a CRM application designed specifically. It's like a salesforce.com for private equity. And they do exactly that. They basically give you six months or a year virtually free. And then they let you know after year one, it's X amount. And it's not a small amount, but there's, there's a fee to it. That transparency is important. So there's no surprises. We budget for that. But we also know we've got the luxury of if we don't like it in four months, boom, we kill it. And we go to one of their competitors and they don't lose any sleep over it. And their competitors have a similar pricing scheme. So I think if you have a product 
that is really B2B, you can do that. It's hard to do a B2C. Uh, consumers are very fickle and you know, going from zero to anything is a bad thing. Um, but for the business world, transparency is key. They want to build a budget a year or two years out. It's a great model. It's, it happens a lot actually in the medical field too. Um, you'll see a lot of software for digital health, remote patient monitoring, things like that. The company will provide that to the healthcare system or the hospital at zero cost for the first year. And if they don't like it nine months in, boom, they just don't have to use it anymore because it's all in the cloud running on a server that's creating a lot of heat. Um, essentially, you can uh, move to the competitor or just not use it anymore. Good. How are we doing for time, Jeff? We'll stop at five of them. Great. We talked before about advertising. I just thought I'd put up some fun numbers there. A little bit mind-boggling. Uh, $225 billion in 2023 in just advertising revenue uh, for Google, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, one thing that has changed, though, is their market dominance. Their market share, if you look at the market share, and this is based on market share of search, right? So are you using Bing? Are you using something else? Um, that's dropped. Google was a solid 91 to 94%. They owned the world, everything. It, they've now become a, an expression, right? Like I, I've got to look up something, why don't I Google that? So you may not be using Google. You may be using another one of the search engines. And this is where the competition is getting really fierce. You've got the Microsoft search engines, you've got other groups coming out with it. And a lot of them are very much uh, trying to differentiate their AI, not their search anymore. Google won the search wars. Many of you may remember, maybe not all of you, Lycos, Alta Vista, Yahoo. I mean, I don't know how many others. There were more search engines than you could shake a stick at. We were all using different ones. People had their favorite. Google crushed them all because Google had the best algorithms. They had the absolute best algorithms and they provide it in a very, very easy to use format. Look at the Google homepage. It is the most uncluttered homepage in technology. It's incredible. There's a white page with a bar, it says Google at the top, and it might have something below it. That's all it is. So they created simplicity and because of very complex algorithms, they won the search wars. What they're fighting to hold on to now is market share because now AI is driving search. And you've got Microsoft and everyone else coming after Google on the AI side. Uh, medical device, this is something I shared in the beginning. And I know a lot of you are sort of touching upon that field. This is a wild industry, right? You know, you not only have a product to create, but you have to think about the regulatory compliance. What is the R&D component of this? Because you might be doing some of the R, the research here, and you may be doing the development and the manufacturing offshore. So you have to think about what is the market access going to be like? We have a, a company in the diabetes imaging area right now that, that we are uh, moving forward with. And you know they're based in Europe. Their manufacturing is happening in Asia. The team is in Europe. The market is the US. And because of that, they have to think about CE marking in Europe. And they have to think about FDA approval in the US. So that business model needs to be really well thought out, right? They have to check a lot of boxes. And then not only that, you're dealing with payment, which is another piece that's important, right? If you think about a medical device in the US, you have to get FDA approval, but that still doesn't mean anything. You haven't sold a single product. You need to now get reimbursement. If you're selling it, let's say in the UK, the good part is you have one reimbursement. You've got a single healthcare system there, the National Health Service. So if they approve your product that's been that's been approved, it can be sold. Doesn't mean it will sell, but it can be sold anywhere with one reimbursement. In the U.S., it's very very hard because you have different reimbursement models throughout the United States. If you're dealing with Kaiser Permanente on the West Coast, you're dealing with Partners Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield on the East Coast. So this is a great great sort of a business to be in but you have to have all of these things about your model really, really flushed out. And uh, I think uh, I'm gonna end here. So some final thoughts. Uh, adaptability is key. Customer-centric approach, whether it be B2B, B2C, B2B2C, whatever it might be. And 
innovate constantly. If you are not coming up with new ways in order to continually be competitive within your marketplace, somebody else will come out of the blue, just like Netflix destroyed Blockbuster and Amazon destroyed most of the bookstores in the world and the list goes on. Constantly enhancing your product and the way you think about your business. And uh, I wanna thank you all for your questions. I'm happy to answer any more if you do have any. Thank you. Thank you. Any other last questions before Joe kicks me off stage? <laughs> I would never kick you off, Rich. Hi, um, thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. I have a question about how, or if and how you diversify your business model. It seems like you mentioned some examples become successful because they rely on one single business model, such as Google. But there are others who become also successful because they diversify their business models. So my question would be if and how, and how you weigh your business models. Yeah, I mean, it's a much longer discussion than I could. I, I could share just a few thoughts on this. One is if your business model is not working, you're going to diversify, right? Or you're going to go out of business. You're just going to implode and the game, it's game over, right? If your business model is working, but you see opportunities to drive revenue and value in other markets, that's when the new business model comes in, right? Think about Amazon. They started as a bookstore. Now you can buy anything on Amazon. Do you know where Amazon makes a breathtaking amount of money that has nothing to do with consumers or very little to do with consumers? AWS. Amazon Web Services. The government uses AWS. It is one of the most secure cloud-based web services in the world. They, they make billions and billions and billions. So that's not a diversification of business model. That's actually a new business. But the reason they were able to do that is because they already had built trust. People knew I can put my credit card information, my entire shopping list, my home address, my family's addresses. I trust Amazon. And they had a cloud infrastructure so big that they woke up and realized, why don't we harness that infrastructure and actually start to provide cloud-based support? So companies that we invest in, you know, one of them is a company in Switzerland uh, that they use a couple of different cloud services, but they're a very large AWS provider because they're selling to hospitals, they're selling to clinicians, they're getting lots of data, patient data, as well as biological data. So a lot of this has lots of laws and rules around it. They trust Amazon. Right? You're not going to store that at home on your own server. So diversify the business model when there's new opportunity, diversify the business model when it's not working so well, and also think about what are your core assets in your business, and maybe you create a separate entity just to do that, just like AWS did. Can you hear me? Yeah. A great tour de force. I don't know how you did this in an hour and a half, so good job. <laughs> um, I think these business models are great from the entrepreneur standpoint. Yeah. It is my understanding that you are a venture capitalist these days. I wonder if you can comment on the business models uh, for VCs. I think it would be really a great discussion here for, for the audience. You know, We've been thinking about entrepreneurs, business models, but uh, VCs also have business models. I wonder if you could comment on your, your own business models on your- uh, yeah, That's a models. really cool question. Never had that one. <laughs> um, so, the question was, for those that didn't hear is, is correct me if I'm wrong, is forgetting about products and services for a minute, venture capital, including like private equity, is a business, right? And you have to think about each of the things we talked about today apply directly to us. So as a business, there's a couple of things that are dynamic. Number one is, uh, if you're going to start a venture capital fund, what is your primary differentiation? Because guess what? All of them provide one thing. It's capital. And if you just want to go to the fund that has the most amount of capital, you can do that. But what are the differentiating components of it? So with us, our, and it's easier for me to talk about what we do as opposed to, you know, but when we think about investment, we have a couple of differentiations. Number one is we invest only in growth stage companies. That's not common in Europe, right? In Europe, there are thousands of small venture capital funds, 10, 20, 30 million AUM, they invest from you know, 100,000 to two or 3 million. But we come in at the next stage. So that's a differentiation right there. It also allows us as part of our business model 
to drive deal flow because you get a billion dollars sitting in an office and nobody rings your bell, right? So why is it that companies like Kleiner Perkins or locally, you know, Polaris, Flagship, Flybridge, why do they do so well? Because they have deal flow. So one of the things as a, as a venture capital firm, similar to a company selling, you know, widgets, you need customers. We need deal flow. So we need entrepreneurs to come to us and say, hey, we have something really cool we think that you should invest in. So the way we do that is we differentiate ourselves by providing value to the entrepreneurial community. We run programs, seminars, we do speeches, we help entrepreneurs with no expectation of anything in return. But also we work with all of the small venture funds that want their companies to succeed. And they want that company to raise their series B or their series C and not go to the US to do it. So our differentiation is we're in Europe. There's not a lot of growth stage venture funds. So we partner with all the folks that have the great deal flow. They already have these companies in their portfolio and we work with them, but we have to be very specific, right? Like we don't invest in everything. Right? So we have to find the venture funds, just like you have to find the customers for your product. We have to find the venture funds that are investing in the industry sectors we care about, in the geographies we care about. And then we partner with them and invest in their best companies. So just like if you were selling a product, you know, whether it be you're going to sell Rolex watches or Breitling watches, you got to know where am I going to get the customers for that watch, which is totally different than selling Timex or Swatch. The product is the same, but I have to know where I'm getting my customer. And that's one of the other ways you think about differentiation in our industry. There's another way, which is the other side of the equation, which is how you charge fees. Um, but that's a much longer discussion. But you know, in our industry, it's typical that venture capital funds receive a small management fee on the capital committed to the fund that allows you to keep the lights on. And then they receive a percentage of the profit when a company is sold, but only after the capital is returned. So anybody hear the expression two and 20? It's two and 20. So uh, Maybe this is a different class. Yeah, there, there's a reading for tomorrow night's yeah. financing sources that oh, describe good. all of that. So venture funds are paid typically two and 20, which means if you start a new venture fund, you have 200 million or 100 million committed to the venture fund. There's a 2% annual fee that you're allowed to charge those investors in order to keep your business running, right? How are you going to get deal flow, go to conferences, et cetera. And then you get 20% of the profit, but only after the investor gets repaid. So if we make a $5 million investment in a company and that company sells sometime in the future, hopefully the near future, and that investment is now worth 15 million. Okay, so the 5 million, we won't get into like what percentage of the company we own, but our 5 million investment is now worth 15. Remember I said two and 20, 2% 2 management fee, 20% of the profits. So the way that math works is simple. Our 5 million went in, it's now worth 15. First thing we do when we get that 15 million, we give the 5 million back to the investors. And then we split the 10, two and 20. I should say 80, 20. Um, so we keep two, they get eight. So the investors wind up making 13 million off the 5 million. Well, they make, they get back 13 million. So they get their capital plus principal back uh, and profit and we get 20%. So that's how pretty much every venture fund and private equity fund work. You'll hear that expression two and 20 all the time. Good. All right. Oh, wait, one last question. We are gonna end on time. Yeah. So uh, now that you talked about the difference of VC firms in the US versus in the Europe, um, like I'm curious, like, how much of a growth stage firm will be able to survive in Europe? Yeah, so, I mean, Europe is not, right? It's like saying Asia, right? So I, I really can't answer that in any great detail because if you go to France, Germany, or the UK, the venture capital community in those countries is so much more sophisticated, right? They've had venture capital in those countries for 30 years, 20 years. You go to Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Ireland, you go to Portugal, Spain, it's an entirely different world, right? 
And the reason is because venture capital didn't exist in those countries even 10 years ago. Um, so what you have is different economies, different marketplaces and different levels of maturity. So in some countries, they desperately need growth stage capital, as an example. In other countries, they need late stage capital because they've had 20 years of VC. They've got lots of startup venture funds, growth venture funds. Now they need the late stage stuff or they're going to lose their companies to the U.S. The beauty of being in the U.S. And, and many other places is that you could literally start a company on an office here in Cambridge or in New York or Miami. And you could go from seed, like literally ideation stage, seed capital, series A, all the way through your IPO and not change addresses. You can't do that in most places in the world. You're going to need to chase the capital. If you're sitting in Porto, uh, in Portugal, you'll probably get your seed capital done. You're not going to raise 12 million. You can knock on every door. So you have to think about how do I approach the environment? How do I attack, you know, go to more investors? Or you pick up and you move the company to the U.S., which a lot of companies do. So we'll end there. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Rich. Great. Good. Well, tomorrow night, we actually cover financing sources. We'll have a panel on that and then financial projections. So that's a good wrapper for, for Rich.